All right, that's 425, so we're going to get started because people will keep filtering in while I'm doing my uh, initial show and dance. So hi, this is Intellectual Property for Engineers. If that's not the talk you're here for, then why are you still in this room? Um, that's me, that's where I work, and that's what I do, but that's not super relevant to this conversation, so moving on. My legal department requires that I give you several disclaimers before we begin. First, I'm not an attorney and nothing in this talk is legal advice. This talk is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a licensed patent attorney if you have any specific questions about anything here today. Second, the things I'm going to be talking about are mostly US-centric. Intellectual property laws and customs vary around the world, and again, speak to an attorney near you if you have specific questions. I'm going to be covering a lot of different topics, and by the nature of limited time, I can't go hugely deep into any of them. Basically, everything I'm talking about here today could be an entire career, uh, but hopefully this will give you a basis for looking into things more in the future. Okay, disclaimers out of the way. What is intellectual property? Before we define that, we need to define what is property. From a legal point of view, property is, generally speaking, an object over which you have certain exclusive rights. So, for example, if you own some land, that means you get to say who goes on the land, who builds on the land, etc. Not all rights will apply in all cases, but this is close enough for our purposes here. So back to intellectual property, literally speaking, this is property that is intellectual. If you paint a painting, you probably own the physical object. You can sell the physical object, you can rent it, you can smash it, you can burn it, whatever you want, but you also have some rights over the abstract intellectual component manifested as a painting. Before we jump into IP as it is today, let's talk about where it came from. For the tradition that became US IP law, it basically all started in 1624 in England. Some uh, things called patents, or letters patent, had existed before then, but there were generally these one-off decrees by the king or queen that gave monopoly control over an entire industry, and as you might expect, they were deeply unpopular. So in 1624, the statute of monopolies transferred control of those over to the English parliament and ensured that they maintained a uh, temporary patent status. So we're visited again in the Copyright Act of 1710, more commonly known as Statute of Anne. Uh, this created the idea of authors having some control over the reproduction or copying of their work. The U.S. Constitution addressed intellectual property directly, saying, quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. This is later refined into both law and regulation of the jurisdiction of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and the U.S. Copyright Office. For certain other traditions, like continental Europe, the author's right to their creations is considered an inherent or moral right, but in the US, we treat all of these intellectual property rights as the domain of law. You have only the rights assigned to you by the law and nothing else. And keep in mind that everything I'm talking about here today is a patchwork of old laws updating new, and in many cases, basically all of them, the true answer to any question in IP law can only be determined by a court and probably by a judge. Everything that is involved is uh, not just the many, many centuries of uh, laws and regulations, but also case law, writings, etc. I'll try to be careful in my word choice, but basically everything would need a dozen except fours if I was going to be 100% accurate. And I will say this one more time, also many more times, but if you need specific advice, please talk to a real attorney, not me. <laughs> But onward to the adventure in the four main branches of intellectual property. They are, briefly, copyrights, protecting creative works like novels, songs, or source code. Patents, protecting inventions like the latest consumer gadget or algorithm. Trademarks, protecting brand recognition. And trade secrets, protecting the rights of commercial entities to keep secrets. Copyright is the most common form of intellectual property, so let's look at that one first. Meet Bob. Bob wrote a book. Bob sells copies of that book to a whole bunch of people who want to read it. Fantastic. But someone buys a copy of his book, and they just start making copies and selling it themselves. If we want more people to write books, we need to prevent this, and thus was born copyright law. There are six rights that are exclusive to a copyright owner, but three of them are, uh, only have to do with the rights of public performance, and that doesn't really apply because you can't perform software. So for software, these are the three that we care about. The first is the right to make more copies of a work, copyright. The second is the right to create new works based on the old work, or derivative works. And the third is the right to sell or give away, because in most contexts giving something away counts as a sale, uh, the work to the public. If you own the copyright for a work, only you get to do these things. The biggest piece of copyright law in the U.S. is the U.S. Copyright Act of 1976. It basically called a full do-over on the U.S. copyright system. It created the more specific versions of those six rights we just saw, defined what can be copyrighted, what can't be copyrighted, what exceptions to copyright would exist, etc. But the biggest deal in it was that it made copyright completely automatic. Before 1976, you had to go and manually, re uh, manually register and renew your copyright with the Copyright Office. After 1976, it's completely automatic from the moment you have a work, as long as it is something that can be copyrighted. In order to qualify for copyright, it has to meet three main qualifications. First, it has to be original. So you were the person that created it, you're not getting it from somewhere else. Second, it has to be what's called a work of authorship. There's a long list of categories uh, of what counts as a work of authorship, but generally in technology we'll only see two of them, software, uh, literary works and graphic works. And third, it has to be fixed in a tangible medium, meaning that you, for instance, cannot copyright a dance performance, because that's not tangible, but you could copyright a video of it or a script of it or some other tangible form of it. 
sometimes it's easier to think about what can't be copyrighted. First off, facts are not subject to copyright, period. Uh, ideas or concepts aren't allowed because they're not fixed into a tangible medium. Anything made by a government employee during the process of their work is not subject to copyright, although it may get other protections. Uh, something has to be sufficiently creative to count as copyrightable. So for instance, an arrangement of facts like a phone book is not subject to copyright. And finally, a quote useful article is not copyrightable, something where the form is majority dictated by the function of the object. For example, you cannot copyright the lines on graph paper. Those are considered a useful object. However, that last one, the useful article, is somewhat in flux right now. There's a very recent Supreme Court case, Star Athletic of the Varsity Brands, which ruled that some pieces of a useful article may be copyrightable if they are sufficiently creative and separable from the rest of the article. So, <laughs> And the last bit to define is the term of copyright, how long it lasts. The Constitution specified that these would be for limited times, so we're going to gloss over some of the procedural details. Roughly speaking, if it was made before 1923, it's not under copyright, period. If it was made between 1923 and 1978, it is subject to copyright for at most 95 years, possibly less if they screwed up their paperwork. Works published after 1978 and owned by a human being get the lifetime of the author plus 70 years from their death, and uh, things made after 1978 and owned by a company are either 95 years from publication or 120 years from creation if you create it and don't publish it, whichever is shorter. The elephant in the room of copyright term is Mickey Mouse. Uh, Disney is certainly not the only company that advocates for stronger copyright protections, but the Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998 is, for better or worse, strongly associated with the company. As it stands, almost nothing has entered the public domain since 1923, and the impact on the arts is still being felt today. Coincidentally, however, 20, uh, 95 years from 1923 happens to be 2018, next year. So we may see some changes here real soon. Either stuff will finally start entering the public domain again, or they may rush through another jury-rigged, very rapidly written uh, Copyright Term Extension Act. We'll see. <laughs> They're running out of time on that one. Uh, so we know our rights, we know we qualify for copyright. The next thing you usually see are these three words, all rights reserved. What does that mean? That means that we, as the copyright owner, are saying that we are keeping all six, or the three plus the other three we didn't talk about, uh, of those exclusive rights to ourselves. But remember, this is also the default state. If rights are not explicitly shared by the copyright holder, they stay with the copyright holder. If copyright is automatic, what about things you do at work? Uh, those are classified as something called a work for hire. In general, if you are a full-time employee, anything that you are uh, instructed to create during the course of your job, the copyright defaults to being owned by your employer. This is also incredibly complicated. It's subject to multiple weird things in state laws, and your employment contract will override anything in there. But roughly speaking, stuff that you do at work by default belongs to your employer. I'll cover both of these in more detail later on, hopefully if we have time. But briefly speaking, a license is a contract between the copyright owner and somebody else that gives them limited use of some of those exclusive rights, usually subject to terms and conditions. In open source, a license is, instead of being between two, uh, a contract between two specific people, it's between the copyright holder and a generic anyone. Fair use is an exception to copyright where uh, you can use other people's intellectual property subject to certain restrictions. So for instance, I could use that copyrighted Mickey Mouse graphic on the last slide as part of a common critique on the Disney Corporation. So that's the overall concept and structure of copyright. Let's look at a specific legal case. Oracle America v. Google. This was the Java uh, copyright infringement case. So there were three major cases of copyright infringement. There were also some claims around patents, but we haven't gotten to those yet. Uh, the uh, Oracle claimed that Google infringed on the code of the range check function, the Java API as a whole, and 37 other code and documentation files. Setting aside the hilarity of the trial, and it was super hilarious, let's just look at how the decisions played out. The jury in the first trial found that the code of the range check function and the overall Java API were copyright infringement, but that the other code and documentation files were not. The judge reversed two of those things. He, over he overruled them on the other code and documentation file, saying that those were de jure a matter of copyright infringement. But the first judge held that APIs are not a work of authorship because they're a system or method of operation, and that's not a work of authorship, which means you don't get copyright protection on those. Oracle appealed, because of course they did, and the appellate court overturned the original judge, saying that APIs were fixed and tangible medium, they're in source code files, and they represent creative work, and therefore they should be uh, subject to copyright. Uh, however, that first uh, the first jury was deadlocked on whether or not the API infringement was fair use, so a second trial was needed to establish that. And uh, it turns out that Oracle kind of whiffed on this one. Uh, the second, ju or second jury came back that yes, the uh, use of the APIs was copyright infringement, but it was fair use. So as it stands in American law right now, APIs are probably copyrightable, but you probably can't enforce that. <laughs> so why do I bring this up? Because as I said before, uh, the, tr the real truth in any intellectual property question can only come from a court, but the courts are really struggling with understanding how to apply copyright to software. Um, what is or is not creative or what is or is not a tangible medium is real unclear. So, but moving on, because I can't answer all of the questions, I'm not a judge, on to the next major type of IP, patents. 
Whereas copyrights protect specific tangible works of art, patents protect inventions. I'll contradict this a little bit later on, uh, but roughly speaking, instead of specific tangible works of art, patents protect the entire concept of invention. Uh, like the exclusive rights you got from copyrights, patents also give you an exclusive right, called the right to exclude. Uh, this means that the holder of a patent is allowed to prevent anyone else from using the invention described in a patent. Notably, this is only a negative right for others, not a positive right for you. Even with a valid, granted patent, it might still be illegal or impossible to create your invention. For an invention to be patentable, it has to meet three criteria. First, the invention has to be useful. This is the lowest bar, but it does rule out things like you can't patent a perpetual motion machine. Uh, next, it has to be novel, so a new invention, something where the patent application you are filing does not cover any pre-existing inventions, called prior art. And finally, it has to be non-obvious, meaning that at the time of invention, time of the filing of the invention, it would not have been obvious to a, quote, person having ordinary skill in the art. This is often the most contentious part because patent examiners aren't experts in every field, especially not software. So they have to basically rely on post hoc justification from the courts as to what was or was not obvious at the time. But let's say you do meet all, the, all three criteria. You can get a patent, right? Not really. There's a similar thing to the, uh, the works of authorship we saw with copyrights, but they're called inventions patentable in patents, um, except there's only these four top level categories, and then there's hundreds of subcategories on each of these. But uh, in general, everything that is patentable, aside from plant design patents, which live in their own separate system, have to be one of these four things. Or again, just like we saw before, let's reverse it. So you, can't patent, you cannot patent a pure idea, something that has no functional invention made from it, nor can you patent a universal absolute like a law of nature or a mathematical formula. However, you can patent novel algorithms, and what's a mathematical formula versus an algorithm? That's a real fine line sometimes. Similarly, you cannot patent a natural process or substance, no matter how much work you put in to isolate that substance, but you can patent novel manufacturing techniques, and what's an extraction technique versus a manufacturing technique? basically up to writing a very good patent. The fundamental theory of patents boils down to the concept of enabling disclosure. We want to encourage inventors to make awesome things, and so in return they get a 20 year monopoly to turn a profit on their invention, but the quid pro quo is they have to document their invention so thoroughly that anyone in the same field could reconstruct their invention after the patent expires. So inventors get to make their buck for 20 years, and then afterwards we get more inventions as a society. The target of enabling disclosure is this, quote, person having ordinary skill of the art, which we saw before in the non-obvious requirement. It's called a legal fiction. It's a made up person that helps to illustrate certain ideas or concepts in law. The downside of this is it means we don't really have a hard and fast rule of what qualifies as ordinary skill. So again, the courts just kind of make this up as they go and they, I would say, subjectively gotten it wrong several times. For the most part, patent lasts 20 years from the date of filing. Certain extensions do exist if the review process is incredibly long, but usually that only adds an extra year or two. It's a lot shorter than copyright. Uh, copyright we saw was you know, 95 or, or lifetime of the author plus 70 years. So some companies have figured out ways to tweak patents and file them as new inventions, giving, them for, giving themselves 40 or 60 years, but overall they last 20 years. The novelty of a patent is determined by the filing date of the patent, so that, that locks in when it had to have been uh, non-obvious by. Uh, in general, you want to file as early as possible. This means that you will very often want to file a provisional application. This then gives you one year to follow up with the real patent application while retaining the earlier filing date. Within the tech industry especially, patents have become less of a way to defend inventions and more of a weapon. So many companies have these enormous patent portfolios with very complicated cross license agreements with every other large company, which are of course voided if either company sues each other, so that no one can actually get away with patent lawsuits anymore. Uh, this has been mostly a stable solution. I refer to it as mutually assured patent destruction, but it's not really a thing that anyone feels good about. And that leads into non-practicing entities. These are companies that hold patents, but they don't actually use them for anything other than licensing and lawsuits. Not all NPEs are bad. In fact, a lot of NPEs are how things uh, get from academia out into industry, but they're so often misused, you may know them by another name. Patent trolls exist only to try and squeeze money out of companies by threatening or even occasionally filing lawsuits over what subjectively seem like extremely broad or very obvious patents. As the cost of going to uh, court on a uh, patent lawsuit, even a trivial one, is staggering, most people will just pay the troll to go away. What's a troll lawsuit what's versus what's a, an underdog standing up for their legal rights is always going to be subjective, but both of those definitely happen. So another case law example, Alice Corporation versus CLS Bank International. This case revolved around four patents held by Alice Corp covering computerized versions of payment escrow systems. Uh, Alice claimed that CLS was infringing on their patents. CLS counterclaimed that their patents were invalid. We're going to skip over the appeals process because it's not nearly as interesting as last time. Basically, Alice lost a whole bunch of times and appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. In the majority opinion, the Supreme Court held that not only were all of Alice's patents invalid, uh, the entire area of patents that Alice was talking about are invalid. In short, the, de the decision said that taking a non-patentable abstract process or business process and putting it just on a computer does not automatically make it patentable. 
This is a graph summarizing by quarter the number of patent rejections that are specifically citing Alice as the reason for a rejection. That's over 100 a day. <laughs> To call this a big deal is an understatement. The vast majority of software patents now have a target on their back. The t world tech patents is firmly divided into the pre-Alice and post-Alice eras, and a lot of people are calling on Congress to try to reallow those kinds of software patents, but time will tell. But moving on to trademarks. Roughly speaking, trademarks, and also service marks, although I'm only gonna say trademarks from now on because they're basically the same thing and I have a limited time, uh, they identify the source of commercial goods and services. This allows you as a consumer to trust that what you are buying is what you expect. It's a bit different from copyrights and patents. We're not really trying to encourage the creation of new works specifically. Instead, we're trying to encourage the creation of brands which will facilitate commerce, which will make more awesome stuff. As a concrete example, Wikipedia. The Wikipedia brand has a lot of value. People trust it to be a mostly correct encyclopedia, and the Wikimedia Foundation has spent lots of time and money in improving their brand image. Let's say I want to make a competing website and get in on that sweet, sweet donation cash. I can't just copy their website because like copyrights are a thing, probably. Uh, but let's just say I make a website and call it my Wikipedia because I want to hope that people will get confused and assume that I'm Wikipedia. The Wikimedia Foundation doesn't want me just using the goodwill and, and image of their brand, so they will serve me with a very well-deserved trademark infringement lawsuit. So what can be a trademark? Just about anything, it turns out. Most trademarks will be words or graphical marks, which is probably the majority of the ones you've seen, but anything with a strong brand association that you want to prove to the US trademark office can probably be a trademark. So for example, the classic Coca-Cola bottle outline or the MGM lion roar are both trademarked. In order to register for trademark protection, you need to demonstrate actual use in commerce via what's called a specimen. So this is proving that you actually have used this mark in real commerce. You can also file an intent to use document where you have to follow up within a fairly short amount of time, again, proving actual use in commerce. Like with copyright, you don't actually have to register your trademarks. You can put a TM on anything that you're just asserting is a trademark with no legal oversight or justification. But if you do register it, you get a couple of advantages. First off, you get to use the snazzy R symbol, but more importantly, you get to start off any trademark lawsuit with an assumption of validity of your trademark. If you just use that TM, you have to start the trademark lawsuit by proving, yes, it really was a valid trademark to start with. Unlike copyrights and patents, which have a fixed term, as long as you're using a mark in commerce, it can last forever. For a registered trademark, you do need to file renewal paperwork every 10 years to prove you're still using it in commerce, but overall, a trademark can last as long as the brand it protects. Trademark infringement is a stupidly complicated issue. The most common factors that are used in determining trademark infringement are called the Polaroid factors after a 1961 trademark infringement case. But roughly speaking, if a random person on the street would confuse your two brands, it's probably trademark infringement. And one word that you've seen probably a whole bunch of times in connection with uh, trademarks is dilution or genericification. This is the idea that a trademark must be actively protected via litigation in order to remain valid. This is technically true, and a bunch of valid trademarks that were very, very valuable at the time have been lost due to genericification, or genericide as it is now called. Uh, things like aspirin and escalator used to be real registered trademarks. However, it's a lot more rare than a lot of news media outlets make it out to sound, as in less than 100 confirmed cases of genericide in the entire history of US trademark law. But for example, this is why Google has to continue uh, insisting they are not a verb, because they are probably actually at risk for this. And very briefly, the last main branch of IP, uh, trade secrets. Put very simply, trade secret law is just a legal justification for anything that you can't or won't disclose via other intellectual property systems but still want some legal recourse to keep it private. You can't actually make things secret again, of course, the law can't do magic, uh, but this at least gives you a legal framework for, say, suing the person that leaked it. The canonical example is the recipe for Coca-Cola. Recipes are in general not subject to copyright and you can't really patent a recipe, so a trade secret protection law gives them some legal basis for keeping the recipe to themselves. So that's the four main types of IP, but why do we do all of this? Some of it's for purely capitalistic reasons. It's outlined in the Constitution, et cetera, et cetera, but there's another line of reasoning too, to improve the public domain. Put literally, the public domain is the collective set of all creations which are not under any form of IP protection. To explain the value of the public domain, first we need to talk about the commons. Usually this comes up when we're talking about the famous tragedy of the common theory, where if a resource is 100% communal, it'll eventually end up depleted and we don't want that. Here, the resource that we're talking about is the communal, uh, or not communal, the overall, uh, creativity and thoughtfulness and artistic ability of all of our artists and inventors. If their creativity was 100% communal, they'd have no real reason to use that creativity and we want them to use it to make more awesome stuff. So we give creators some exclusive rights to their creation for a limited time with the promise that after they get some benefit from it, it'll go into the commons and everyone benefits from it. From the writings of Homer to the paintings of Hokusai to the polio vaccine, these public domain works form the cultural, scientific, and technological basis for our world. They act as inspiration to future generation and as the, the shoulders that all new works start from. 
works can be given over to the public domain from the start. You don't have to wait for your copyright to expire, but that can be a little bit difficult in certain jurisdictions. So the Creative Commons maintains a document called CC0, which does its best to make sure that the author is giving up all possible legal rights to work. Consider this as an alternative to licenses and patents whenever you're working on something that you want to belong to the common heritage of all humankind. And briefly, a, a, things more directly related to software, licenses. So why put a license on software in the first place? If you remember back to the copyright section, by default, all of those exclusive rights stay with the copyright holder. This means that if I put some code up onto GitHub without a license, you can't actually use it. Just like I can't walk into an art gallery and start printing t-shirts of all their copyrighted paintings. The original and probably still most common form of software licensing is commercial licensing. You give the copyright holder some money and they give you a license that allows limited use of certain rights, like for instance, you can copy it from the install disk to your computer, but you can't sell it to the public and you can't prepare derivative works. These are usually wrapped up in the end user license agreement or EULA, along with a cornucopia of other legally dubious contract clauses. But the place most of us care about this is open source software. Instead of a EULA between a specific copyright holder and a purchaser, this is a contract between the copyright holder and a generic anyone. So let's look over, uh, look over the MIT license uh, section by section. We're going to start with a declaration of who owns the copyright and what years the copyright covers. As I said before, we don't need to do this because copyright protection is automatic, but we do want to make sure it's explicit, so we put it in our MIT license. Next, we take a whole bunch of words about our exclusive rights, and we say that you can use the three important rights to software subject to certain conditions. There are three conditions specifically. First is that notice condition at the top that says that you have to include the copyright and license text in all future copies of the software. And then that yelly part in all caps contains uh, conditions two and three, a limitation of liability and a warranty disclaimer. Together those help to insulate the copyright holder from certain provisions in uh, default commercial law in the US. But we put all this together and it means that as long as you adhere to those conditions, which are relatively minimal, you get rights to use the software, people can use it, everyone's happy, we have open source, yay. Usually the next question after talking about the MIT license is, what about BSD? BSD family of licenses are minimalist like the MIT license, but they add a couple extra conditions around publicity and advertising. Unfortunately, software patents have crashed this party, even post Alice. Uh, being minimalist, both BSD and MIT are really only uh, written to deal with copyright licensing, not really patents. The first kind of interaction between software patents and uh, open source is if I'm open sourcing something, or more generally my company is open sourcing something that we claim is covered by a patent that we own. So we want to give both a copyright license through say MIT or BSD as well as a patent license. Um, the text on screen there is the Facebook auxiliary patent grant. But the more interesting case is somebody gives a submission to your project, they open a pull request, they send you a patch, whatever. You love it, you merge it, et cetera, everything is great. Sometime later their legal department rolls up and says, well actually that patch, that code uh, was covered by a patent that we control. We're not only gonna sue you for patent infringement, we're gonna sue all of your users. Fortunately, to the best of my knowledge, this has never actually happened, but newer licenses like to try to prevent it from the start. So that's the patent grant from the Apache 2.0 license. The Apache license, it's a lot newer than MIT and BSD, so it has a lot more specific language. It more specifically enumerates the rights that are being given. It has text in there for dealing with patent licensing, trademark licensing, uh, all kinds of nice things. Uh, but it still puts very few restrictions on the end user, just like MIT and BSD. Originally described in 1985 by Richard Stallman, copyleft is a license which allows derivative works, but requires that the derivative works be licensed in a similar way to the original. So compare this to the MIT, BSD, or Apache licenses, which all allow derivative works, but say basically nothing about what those works have to look like. This philosophy has led to a whole family of copyleft licensing, mostly varying on what constitutes a derived work and who has to be permitted access to the source code. The most famous and most common of the copyleft family is the GNU general public license. So this requires that all derivative works be licensed under the GPL or a compatible license and that anyone with access to the binaries or sort, uh, binaries of the compiled product get access to the source code and build environment. The conditions of the GPL inspire a lot of fear and confusion, so let's talk about the two main ones. The first is the virality condition, which says that uh, any combined or derivative work that's based on GPL code must be distributed under a license that puts no more restrictions on the user than the GPL itself. The problem is, what actually qualifies as a derived work? The obvious case is just taking some GPL code and modifying it. That's unambiguously a derived work, end of story. You have to put that under something GPL compatible. The more complex case is linking. The, the creators of the GPL insist that both static and dynamic linking, so for instance, import in Python is a form of dynamic linking, would create a derived work on the fly uh, and that that would activate the virality clause of the GPL. There is a similar license, the LGPL, which specifically allows linking as creating a non-derivative work, but uh, <laughs> 
any modifications to the library itself would have to be GPL compatible. Oddly enough, the applicable case law in here comes from a case in the 80s, Galoob Toys v Nintendo of America. Nintendo tried to assert that the Game Genie created by Galoob created a derivative work on the fly because it was dynamically linking into the ROM code inside uh, SNES cartridges. The court held that it did not. Uh, this certainly lends a lot of weight to people that don't think the GPL is as viral as it is because while static linking might create a derived work, this certainly indicates that the court holds that dynamic linking does not create derived works. The other bugbear in uh, GPL stuff is code sharing. This requirement says that any user of GPL code has to be able to freely modify it, so anyone that has access to the binaries has to be able to rebuild it to suit their needs. Uh, for GPL, this only applies to people that have access to the binaries. There's another uh, another license, the Afero or AGPL, which says that anyone that has access to over the network also has to get source code. Mostly I've been talking about licenses as applied to software code. Hopefully your project will include things like uh, screenshots and documentation that are not code. For that, Creative Commons has a whole fleet of licenses that lets you dial in exactly what rights you want to give people, as well as maintaining that rights waiver CC0 that's not technically licensed, but close enough. And here I get to put my finger on the scale as we reach the end of the talk. Uh, my personal opinion for new projects, there's only two licenses that make sense anymore. GPL v3 if you want copy left, or Apache 2.0 if you do not. And if I can go a little bit further, I'm firmly in the permissive license camp. There's certainly places where the GPL and copyleft ideas are important. However, your code probably isn't one of them. And we are running low on time, so I'm going to skip my bonus topics. Sorry. You can read about them online. All right. So. We talked about copyrights and how they protect uh, new artistic or creative works. We talked about patents and how they encourage novel inventions. We talked about trademarks and how they facilitate commerce. Uh, we talked about trade secrets and how they let companies keep things to themselves. And we talked about the public domain, the value of the commons. We talked about licenses and how they allow people to actually use software while navigating all the protections of intellectual property. And a few resources very briefly because I'm about to get kicked off the stage. Cornell LII has a great copy of all of US law or as much of it as they can. Um, the book IP and open source by Van Lindbergh, disclaimer he's a friend, but it's a great version of everything that I have spoken about in this talk and way, way more because it's a book and not a 25 minute talk. Um, USPTO website has a lot of great educational resources and also home to the test trademark search system. So if you want to search for what is a trademark, um, you do that on USPTO website. USPTO also has a trademark or has a patent search system, but Google patents is often a little bit easier to navigate and nicer and faster. Uh, and finally, the This Week in Law podcast from the Twit Network, great way to keep up. Uh, you can find this talk there, and thank you. We don't really have time for questions, but I'll be down here if you have questions. Thank you.